Welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see you here today. It is um, a real privilege and honor to share the screen with my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Blackwell. I could probably speak for the next 30 minutes just uh, reciting all of his achievements and accomplishments over a life that's been filled with service in ways that we can only imagine. In 2020, we gave Dr. Blackwell the Avanzino Leadership Award and couldn't think of a more worthy recipient to carry on the tradition that I think Rich Avanzino started when he became such an innovative leader, somebody who was willing to go where nobody else would go. And that's pretty much Dr. Blackwell. He has um, done things that um, most of us would probably never even think of. I mean, 20 plus years that he spent in public service working in the government, trying to make a difference and definitely achieving that on probably a daily basis, keeping his practice in Maryland, learning from his father, who was a veterinarian in Oklahoma. The, I mean, it's just, it's such a rich and varied history and story. And it's one that we are so proud and honored to be able to share with all of you today. So, we spoke with Dr. Blackwell a few weeks ago and his early experiences in dealing in a very, very segregated world and how those experiences have really shaped him to the pioneering um, and compassionate leader that he is today. So let's have a look and then we'll come back to and talk more with him here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Blackwell. Uh, I grew up in the profession of veterinary medicine. My dad was the first veterinarian in Southeast Oklahoma. So I've been around animals all my life. We had a whole assortment of um, pets and livestock who so really steeped in the world of animals and animal welfare. As a veterinarian, of course, uh, by training, very much dedicated to the welfare of animals. From a very early age, I uh, started to follow my dad around. I just was very, very much bonded to my dad. And so I spent all my time in the practice, his practice, if I were not in school or doing chores. Um, I came to appreciate um, early in life what it means to be of service to others, uh, largely because of my dad's practice. early days of my dad's practice were very much still days of segregation. As a kid, I, of course, like most kids, didn't, didn't have a clue about life and more importantly, um, the conflicts that, that we still see today, uh, even hate, frankly, uh, that we still see today. Uh, most of his clients were white and um, and so I grew up very much um, early in my early years, um, not knowing that there were uh, businesses that were black, but their patrons were all black. I didn't realize that he was ex demonstrating before me the fact that as a minority in the United States, uh, I had the potential to be successful as a professional and therefore, what I'm saying is I was fortunate to be to not be shackled by um, a belief that uh, because I, I'm a minority, that uh, I would forever struggle or uh, that the, the system was really too difficult to overcome. I appreciate those early lessons. My dad was involved with civil rights in those days. And by the time I was in eighth grade, he had been appointed by the governor to the Oklahoma Civil Rights Commission. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, I, I remember vividly as though it was yesterday, the day that he took me for a walk, wanted to talk with me. And I, of course, I'm like, what did I do wrong? I'm, <laughs> am I in trouble? And he wanted to explain to me um, why he wanted me to go to the white high school. Um, now, that was a, a very unexpected conversation. 
he went on to explain that um, the state of Oklahoma was uh, undergoing change, uh, as pointed out by the Supreme Court decision that separate but equal was not only uh, unconstitutional, it just was not working. Ultimately, um, I trusted my dad, his judgment. And so I certainly agreed to, to um, go to the white school. Well, I was one of four students uh, and uh, we were the first four in when Oklahoma decided to offer choices uh, for students. And my dad told me before I would graduate that all of the black students were gonna be in that school. And that's exactly what happened. I guess by my junior year, the black school had been closed. Um, so I early on came to front and center, appreciate that this country really had some growing to do. Um, just in contrast, my dad used to periodically go visit one of his colleagues or they'd visit him. So I thought the world was full of black veterinarians. I had no clue <laughs> that we were very rare. Um, it's amazing how the world might look through the eyes of, of a very young person. And, and through the through time, we start to lose that innocence as we come to appreciate some realities that were not um, evident at the beginning. When I look back over those years, um, again, in spite of some negative things uh, that existed or experiences uh, that I had, in the balance, um, I can today still say, well, in the balance, I'm a privileged person. It's a privilege to be a veterinarian. And uh, I remind myself every day that I have an obligation to use that privilege. There's a power that comes with privilege. And anybody in our society who is so fortunate to enjoy privilege ought to remind him or herself that's given unto us for a reason, and in my thinking, to help others. When I first became aware that as a Black person, I couldn't go into certain businesses, that happened when um, one of my dad's employees uh, was going to go get lunch and invited me to tag along. And of course, I was given permission to go with him. We go downtown, small town in Oklahoma, by the way, and to this major restaurant in downtown. Uh, and um, as we're approaching the building, I'm coursing right toward the front door while he's turning to go around the side of the building, which confused me. Turns out he had to go around to the back of that restaurant and enter into a door in the back that was right off the kitchen. And that's where black people had to go to eat. It was just a little table set up in there. And you know, that was a progressive organization <laughs> because I also remember walking through the front door of some business just to be told that they didn't serve the N-word. Um, and of course you turn around and walk right out of there very quickly, by the way. So, um, I, uh, I'm fortunate to have had the early experiences, some of which were uh, shocking or even traumatic, but they helped to shape me into an individual who um, has been able to survive in this world in, in a way that I'm, I'm very happy about. You know, during those uh, early years of growing up in my dad's practice, my anticipation was to go off to veterinary college and then come back and join him in practice. But he actually closed his practice while I was a senior in high school, became a faculty member at the School of Veterinary Medicine, Tuskegee University. And so that's where I went to school. I was, like most veterinary students, a bit intimidated by what was ahead of me, but boy, did those early experiences show up in veterinary college. Um, the first two years, I was like any other student learning the basic sciences of medicine, you know, what normal looks like, what abnormal looks like, how disease processes occur, and then, of course, starting to learn what we do to intervene to, um, to treat uh, diseases or conditions. 
By the third of, uh, and certainly the fourth year, uh, I stood out uh, because I knew how to do a lot of things, including lasso. <laughs> we had students from uh, from the northeast, from the city, and those guys didn't know anything about <laughs> livestock. Um, I grew up around livestock, so um, I started to separate out. And uh, uh, I, re I remember the day when my little schnauzer ended up jumping out of the window of the car while it was moving. He saw something he wanted to go after, and he ended up fracturing his leg uh, right at the hip, actually. And I was given permission to, um, to repair that fracture given permission by by the um, chief surgeon. And so I was able to actually um, put a screw into that uh, fracture and uh, Isaac, his name, he went on to recover and do well. Well, I was comfortable with surgery because I'd seen so much of it. And in fact, I had, had spayed my own dog when I was 12 um, without my dad being there. Of course, he gave me permission to do it. And so uh, as a veterinary student, it, I was challenged as much as, uh, as most are, but also appreciated that uh, experience means a lot. Exposure means a lot. We had students who had not been around veterinarians very much. And so that mattered. Well, rather than going back joining my dad, I actually went back to Oklahoma uh, and reopened the building that was his practice. And so my intent was to basically have a practice like I grew up in, a general practice, large animals, small animals, just about anything that comes along. But during those uh, early years, I started to question my calling. Uh, increasingly, I wasn't sure that I was doing the work that I'm supposed to do in this very small town with a general veterinary practice. And there was a day when it all became a lot clearer that I needed to make a change. A little girl had been struck by a car um, not far from where my clinic was, uh, was located. And I something overcame me. And I found myself going to that hospital, sitting in the emergency waiting area with her family, who I didn't really know. Um, and the whole time, just kind of processing, what, what am I called to do? And the voice I kept hearing is, you know, you really spend time really working hard to take care of these, uh, these animals, these patients, and just look at society as a whole. So that the image of this child struggling to survive uh, from being hit by a car translated into a struggling society for me. And the fact that I was supposed to have a role bigger than that, than being in the practice. And so I ended up um, closing my practice and uh, moving to the Washington, D.C. area, joined the Food and Drug Administration. It was supposed to be a stepping stone, mind you. I was supposed to go there, figure out what the next step would be. In fact, I thought that I would be um, going back to, to medical school and become a physician because I, I was just exploring, trying to find out what are you supposed to be doing? I knew it was to help people. I knew it was to benefit society. Uh, that was all very clear. Well, the one reason I knew I wasn't gonna be a physician is this. Growing up around uh, many animals who had medical problems and were being cared for, I came to appreciate just how much they wanna live. The fact that they, would get on their feet as soon as they could. They wanted to get out into the sun and, and, and let the sun do its healing power. Um, they could appreciate um, my dad or someone trying to help them and ultimately myself. And we knew, I knew they appreciated that help. And I would contrast those images with humans that, I don't know why I came up with these images, but of a human, who was lying up in bed and complaining about everything and wanting someone to nurse them and take care of them. I don't want to lift my arm. You lift my arm. Um, I knew I couldn't be in clinical medicine with humans. <laughs> 
Well, that stepping stone uh, at the FDA turned into a 23-year career with the United States Public Health Service. Years that I thoroughly enjoyed, um, would do all over again. I served those years in uniform as a commissioned officer of the United States Public Health Service, ultimately reaching the rank of Assistant Surgeon General or Rear Admiral. And that path happened because of two key things. First of all, along the way, there were people who observed me and for whatever reason, wanted to mentor or support me along the way. They were mostly white, not, not minorities, although there were minorities. That implies that, well, the minorities weren't around for one. <laughs> um, but um, there were these folks along the way who were just key in my uh, growth and development. And um, the other reason was that while I had my real job as defined by my job description, I was always willing to volunteer to be on committees or whatever, because I was mission driven, you know, you're, you're working to make the organization better. And more importantly, as a federal official, I literally drank the Kool-Aid. I was proud of doing work on behalf of Americans that I was there to represent the interests of an American who couldn't be there on his or her own behalf to represent themselves. And so many of my colleagues had the same attitude. I bring that up because unfortunately there are many today who are critical of our government. And I understand how we, we got here, but most of our government are dedicated servants who are not politically motivated, they show up each day and apply themselves on behalf of this nation. I thought I would be on active duty for a number of uh, years longer than I ended up being on active duty. And what happened was, it was 1999 and um, I was chief of staff of the Office of the Surgeon General, the only veterinarian that's held that, that position. And, um, the University of Tennessee was trying to fill the, the deanship, sent me a letter inviting me to apply. What I agreed to do was go down to the University of Tennessee um, and just share my vision of veterinary medicine. And that vision was the need to refocus on public health. Now, mind you, 1999, we were very, very busy with national security planning and in the case of the U.S. Public Health Service, concern about biologic weapons, somebody intentionally releasing uh, an infectious agent in a community in order to create fear. That's terrorism, not necessarily to kill, just unsettle us as Americans. The most likely microbes or agents that would be used as a weapon are zoonotic diseases, meaning diseases that occur in animals that can affect humans. And yet the veterinary colleges were not focused on that as much as we used to be and as far as public health. So I ended up taking the position of Dean and I had two compelling reasons. Number one was this mission of, okay, here's a college asking me to come in and bring about those changes. So I need to stop talking about it, or get in and help. The second, second more important reason was more personal. It was the year 2000. So we're into the 21st century. There had never been a minority dean of a veterinary college outside of Tuskegee University, which is a historically black college. And I believe that, you know, there's got to be a first. you got to break that mold. And once you do so, um, it kind of creates a new reality for young people about what's, what's doable. So I felt an obligation as a minority to break that mold. I accomplished 
much of what I wanted to as dean. We got public health training into our curriculum. Other veterinary colleges started to do that, especially post 9-11. But I was also able to uh, get started what's now known as veterinary social work. Because going to the uh, University of Tennessee, I'd left my practice in Maryland uh, and during that time came to appreciate the human animal bond. I had clients who were so bonded and so close to their non-human family member, they would perceive a problem, something going on, even before the scientific instruments could pick it up. Meaning I could take blood to see what this problem may be that they were perceiving. And the blood work would come back normal and just give it another day or two and boom, there was a problem. So I said to myself, we as a profession are really not ready for uh, this new world where people are so bonded with their pets as family members. And um, what coupled that reality was At that same time as chief of staff of the Office of Surgeon General, we were producing the first Surgeon General's report on mental health. As I thought about over the years, looking across that exam table into the eyes of my clients, and certainly at that time, how often we were looking into the eyes of depression or anxiety, all related or mostly related to what was going on with that loved one on the table, that non-human family member. And so I believed that we needed to partner directly with another profession that could assist us in better serving our clients. That's the new paradigm. We're in the business of delivering services to families by focusing on the non-human members as veterinarians, but also working with allied professionals to make sure that we're ministering to the family as a whole. Because, you know, this is important for animal welfare. We often talk about barriers to, for example, veterinary care, which is the work we're doing today. And you know what? There are no barriers that the animals are putting up. The barriers are human factors. And so uh, to the the extent to which I can reach a non-human that needs medical care, we need a system that's addressing the, the humans in their life who really represent the barrier to that health care. The 2008 recession happened at a time that I was quite involved with shelter, uh, sheltering, animal sheltering. I'd been the board chair for five years of a shelter in Knoxville, Tennessee, Young Williams Animal Center, a well-resourced shelter in the balance. I saw all these pets being relinquished because the e- of the economic impact of that recession. I saw society through a different lens. Now, what do I mean by that? 2008 reminded me of things I had kind of forgotten along the way, that there are those who live with little, and when something happens, it throws them into a very, very bad place. These families did not want to relinquish their pets, but they could no longer care for them, like basic things like feed them and then feed the children or take care of the mortgage or whatever, or rent. So that was the first time when I really had my eyes open to our real society as America, as it relates to animal welfare. But the real moment happened when um, a dog was injured and um, it was a treatable problem. The owner was found, came in the next day, and this this guy happened to be a Vietnam veteran, very humble guy. And uh, of course, he he was very, very just, just 
torn up by the fact that not only was his companion, his family member injured, he couldn't pay for the care. Now, this was a, not just any family member. See, it turns out this was the family member that helped him to get back on his feet after he suffered a stroke. That was a constant companion. Um, and you could look at this individual and know that this family member was being well cared for. So due to no fault of, of the, um, the pet's person, that veteran, um, here the pet was injured and the veteran couldn't pay for it. And it resulted in euthanasia. And it was on that day at that moment, actually, when I almost said out loud, what are we doing? What are we doing where we can't even ensure health care for those who have served our nation? Uh, it was not only veterans that I thought about. I thought about our school teachers. I thought about many others who have dedicated their lives to the benefit of society, to help society, oftentimes not even getting paid much for the work they're doing. And are you telling me that we can't provide them health care for the human or the non-human members? Well, the country has worked over the years very hard, I believe, to try to ensure health care for humans. We've not worked so hard, as hard as we needed to, to reach the non-human family members. It was then that I knew I had a new mission in life, the mission that I'm on now. We can do better. We can ensure that non-human family members receive health care, and especially for those who have dedicated their lives, contributed to our society that many of us benefit from. I envision a future where this country, by necessity, will have built a system of approach to improve health care. We designed a system called Align Care. The aligning part really gets at the fact that this is the United States of America. We are, by world standards, a wealthy nation. Yes, there is income inequality but there are resources in this country. If we just better align the resources that we have with the intent of ensuring healthcare for non-human family members, we can make that happen. When Maddox Fund first heard about um, the idea, the vision for Align Care, here we had an organization, and when we say organization, we sort of drill down to the actual people in that organization who make decisions. They captured the vision. They saw the same future, the same possibility, and put resources behind supporting the work. I mean, significant resources. I mean, resources that says, without a doubt, these people are serious about trying to make that future happen. We need to look carefully at our communities and go back to an approach where we get things done at the community level. There's not a reliance upon Washington, D.C. or the State House, but rather our communities. And when we say communities, we're talking about a collection of human and non-human members. But shelters really are social service agencies when we think of non-human community members. And whether they are in a family already or the agency is trying to get them into a family, it's about families. And so we've got to relinquish this very animal-centric posture, veterinary medicine or animal welfare, and take on a family-centric posture to the work that we're doing. I think our communities are going to be driven to refocus on community development, which gets down to family well-being, uh, family health, and that family is human and non-human. 
and uh, it gives me a lot of reason for hope about our future. We're not a perfect nation. We'll never be perfect. Let's embrace hope, folks. We we can we can build a brighter future future as as individuals, as communities, as a nation, and our human and non-human families will be better off for it. Dr. B, you know, I always call you Dr. B every once in a while. I call you Michael. I want to thank you for not wearing a tie today. I should tell everyone in the audience that uh, Dr. B's less formal approach to the world is a direct response to his association with Batty's Fund. And every once in a while, we even get him to curse. Not often, but every once in a while. And again, that's just an association with all of us, which we so appreciate. But um, you just filled us with so much great information. You know, one of the things I was thinking about was that often we say that we um, come to animal welfare because we only want to deal with the animals. We don't want to deal with the people. And for a while there, I've been thinking how short-sighted that was and, and, and actually how wrong that is. And then it occurred to me as I was listening to you this afternoon that I think that I've been looking at this thing wrong and that the reality is animals bring us to this movement because animals love us unconditionally. And for many of us, that unconditional love is that thing that opens the door to our own heart and to our own compassion. And what you have done with Align Care and with the work that you've done is shown us that we've taken one step and now it's important to take the next step. And the next step is being able to look at, at the whole equation that not just the animals, but the animals and the people they're connected to. Yeah. And that is just such a powerful place for us to be. Can you talk more about where Align Care is right now and some of the work that you've done? Because I think it so epitomizes the value and importance of bonded families. Thank you so much, uh, Mary. I appreciate all of your, your comments. And you can keep training me. I'm trainable, so <laughs> just keep working with me. Uh, we are so happy to be where we are with this project. Uh, just a quick recap. We spent a couple of years figuring out how a system can work, a system intended to reach families that currently are underserved, recognizing that the big barrier is finances and um, how veterinary practices could, could help out. We, the third year was when we tested this and that testing ended in June, actually kind of extended a little past June in Nevada. And we learned a lot. We learned that, yes, there is a way to reach these families when we align our resources. Um, by the time uh, we got into the fall, we had uh, enrolled just under 1,000 families and more than 2,000 pets. These are individuals that would not have received health care were it not for, for Align Care. And Align, Align Care wouldn't exist without Maddie's Fund. So thinking of where we are today, I remember those early days in private practice, reading about this organization called Maddie's Fund, who's doing all this spay neuter thing and just really addressing a societal problem. Well, we have a good story to tell. You know, the industry came together and built animal sheltering as a, as a way of addressing uh, community needs. And we've succeeded in so many parts of this country uh, in reducing the number of of adoptable pets that are, are euthanized. The next real frontier is keeping these pets with their families. And that means a holistic approach, not just veterinary care, but it's often housing or food and um, some other things that may lead to relinquishment. So thank you for all that you all have done and for the opportunity to work with you without a tie. <laughs> So, and uh, I also want to mention, this is the first that I heard about Isaac the Schnauzer. So it seems to me that there's uh, destiny and fate have played roles in bringing us all together. Yeah. So I didn't want to um, let this hour pass without mentioning that. I just love that. So That's the first time I saw Maddie, it just went right deep <laughs> into my heart because I have a sense of what Maddie may have been like. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Thank you so much for that. That really, actually, thank you. That's great. So 
<clears throat> I love the idea that uh, the concept that you talked about, that the barriers are of our own making. And as we think about what we want to do going forward, I mean, for many of the people on this call, for many of the people that would be watching your video after this, you know, it's uh, the work that they do becomes all consuming. And sometimes it's really hard to put your head up and think about what the future holds. But as you talked about the um, future and thinking of the work that we do as social service agencies, where do we start? What, what do we do? How do we start to make that happen? I think we start, when I say we, I'm talking about the animal welfare industry, but also veterinary medicine. We really must start by understanding that our communities are made up of families, families that have human and non-human members. Um, when we start there, then we start to think differently about our role in supporting our communities, our families. Um, but we also come to recognize that what, what worked in the 20th century may not work so well in the 21st century because our society continues to evolve. The demographics continue to shift. And so knowing our communities, being culturally competent, um, meaning as we become a more diverse nation, understanding that we need to reach all communities in order to keep uh, ourselves healthy. So I'm, I'm happy that those conversations are underway. I often say this with respect to the Haas project, because I, I know Maddie's Fund supports that initiative and at the heart of it, as I understand it, is this transformation to be a social service agency and um, I'm optimistic about what tomorrow will look like. So uh, Cassie, if you'd like to unmute, you have a good question there for Dr. B. Hello. Hi, Dr. Hi. B. Um, Hello. Hi. We do have a, a um, program in British Columbia similar to Align Care, but I'm just wondering for those of us who say you know, I like animals more than people is very common. I definitely have said that. Um, it's because we've been let down and mm -hmm. to mistrust of other humans. How do we recognize this and start to include families again? Yes, it's a wonderful question and I appreciate it. And you may recall in the video, I talked about, there's no way I'd do clinical medicine with humans. <laughs> But I like humans. Um, I think the way forward for someone like yourself, as you describe yourself, is to understand your success in reaching the animals or reaching those individuals in the community that are not human must, by design, include humans. Uh, we want humans to have them in their homes. We want humans to pay for their care. We want, hum we can go on and on and on. In other words, then as a veterinarian, when I see that patient, I understand that that patient's not gonna pay me. It's going to be that patient's person and on and on and on. So I, I think it's not so much saying I'm gonna recreate myself and wake up tomorrow and I love all humans. No, humans give us a lot of reasons to, to uh, have your attitude. <laughs> Uh, but um, let's let's keep our, our eye on our goal to help those um, those non-human members of our community. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cassie. Uh, Dr. Miller, Lila Miller has a great question. Oh. Lila, can you unmute? Yeah, it, it's you know such an honor to, to participate in this this candid conversation. I want to thank Maddie for that. And Michael, I remember when you. So many times I've said, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So seeing a line chair where it is now, I remember the day when you first said, this is what I'm going to do. But my question to you, and we've talked about this before, is how do we get the veterinary community involved in this? And they're all yes. there on right now. It is the high cost of veterinary care, student debt, <clears throat> you know, the whole mental health crisis amongst veterinarians. I heard a statistic that something like 44% of veterinarians are thinking about leaving the profession. Has, has the AVMA or AHA or anybody come up with um, or reach out to you to uh, say they want to 
participate in frequent access to care. Well, hello, my friend. I appreciate uh, you attending and thank you so much for the question. I'm optimistic about what the future holds with respect to the veterinary profession, but it's not because we're in the lead. It's because we're going to get dragged down a road that this nation is already on. And let's start with the demographic shift that's happened. Largest um, pet owning cohort of Americans are the millennials, yet they are predicted to not make the income of their parents' generation. First generation of Americans to come along that would not exceed the previous generation. That means that these business models that we built in the 20th century for a higher average income society must change. They will have to. Um, the well-being of veterinarians' mental and emotional health is tied up into this because we're not built to turn people away and not help them when we have the knowledge and the capability to help them. I believe uh, the millennial generation is the one to watch. More than 50% of veterinarians now are millennials. And these guys have been handed a whole list of stuff like climate, <laughs> like social problems, and on and on and on. So I, I remain optimistic, Lila. I, I think it will be by force that the veterinary profession will be on board. One last thing I'll say, uh, in our national study uh, funded by Maddie's Fund, we found, uh, the veterinarians reported as many as, I think we were right at 92% who believed that pets are family members and that when they don't get health care, it impacts the emotional well-being or mental health of that family. Um, so I think we'll get there. It's going to be, it's going to take work and we have to change the, the, the model. We can't use 20th century thinking to address 21st century challenges. And no, I've not gotten where I'd like to with AVMA and, and AHA. I, I'm optimistic about that too. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Thank you, Lila. Cynthia Bullock, would you like to unmute? You raised some really good points in the chat file. Cynthia? Hi, thank you. Uh, Dr. Blackwell, I heard you speak at the AWACS conference in Colorado, and thank you for what you're doing. You. I run a safety net charity whose entire focus is on keeping pets and people together, and I've been doing this for almost 12 years. But what we consistently run up against is not enough support from our own industry. The funders focus is still squarely on adoption, which is the first step, not the last step in the journey. Yeah. So how do organizations like ours who are already doing what you want to do, how do we get the rest of the industry on board and how do we get the love and financial support we need to keep pets and their parents together? Well, thank you, Cynthia, uh, especially for the work you're doing in your community. Uh, and hold tight because help is on its way. And it's kind of related to the previous answer. Uh, change is being forced upon this nation in many, many respects. If we think about the resources that are in animal welfare, this is the least the way I think about it. If some percentage of those resources were directed at keeping these families together, you would start to see more help, more assistance. And I think that change is, is underway. We have to build something, a mechanism by which people can help. So Align Care was conceived in part by saying, we don't operate as a system. Veterinary medicine doesn't operate as a system. Healthcare has to operate as a system. Also, social services have to operate as a system. So those of us who've been helping the non-human members of our communities and, and families just need to help build those systems that will get us to a better place. I wish I could give you a more specific answer, but I'm, I'm avoiding that because I don't know specifically your community. Uh, but I do hope you will remain optimistic that change, change is happening. I'm trying. <laughs> Thank Hold you, on. Cynthia. That was great. <laughs> that is great. Chris Fitzgerald had a question. Hello, thanks for being here. I'm honored to share some virtual space with you, Doc, and with uh, Dr. Miller. Um, that was a special moment. Um, I was wondering, I guess it's kind of about our community, but but you know, we're, we're trying to do everything we can at the shelter. Uh, the private practices are all overworked. 
um, how do we increase access to vet care when when those clinic providers are, are strapped? Yeah. So, yeah, and knowing that if we build it, there's no guarantee that they will come because the, the vets and the techs are in uh, short supply. Yeah. So supply is based on multiple variables. And I think we can all agree that <clears throat> uh, the variable of how many we can train each year in this country can't be ignored. I I think of where human medicine was decades ago, it was in a similar similar place. I mean, the physicians ran everything and they had a few nurses that had to work their way toward, toward the patient. Um, but through time, it was clear there were not enough physicians to do all the things that needed to, to be done. And so allied health professionals were, uh, were trained and, that, and today we've got a bunch of allied health professions. Veterinarians, can't do everything. And so if we come to understand we can't train enough, fast enough, but that's not the end of the story. What are the other options? And this mid-level professional is one that I think needs to continue to gain traction. Uh, this may mean a licensed veterinary technician or nurse who achieves uh, some additional training to operate pretty much like a physician assistant in human medicine. I mean, many of us go into the healthcare system. We don't always see physicians. In fact, more often than not, we're seeing a non-physician. <laughs> and so uh, I think veterinarians get anxious about what I'm saying because it may sound like it's redirecting revenue away from them, but no, oh, it could be done in a way that you integrate these changes with, with the veterinary businesses that exist. Uh, Chris, we've got to fix it. We've got to take it on. It's a relic of the 20th century. I put it that way because it's a dinosaur. It's ill positioned for the 21st century society in which we live. Thanks, Dr. B. Thanks, Chris. So Geraldine De Silva, would you unmute and raise your point? Black will I really? Hi, Mary. Hi, Geraldine. Hi. Um, so, you know, my uh, my comment was really based on the fact we have a ton of veterinary partners. Uh, we work really well with them. But as we increase our referrals to them, you know, the, the guests that we encounter have mental health conditions. They, yes. um, you know, have they're usually in a financial crisis. Yes. And what we're finding is that as we increasingly send more uh, referrals their way, they feel they're not equipped nor trained to deal with these situations. So yes. as a result, they're turning these referrals away. So yes. just trying to figure out like, you know, the training that we are trying to incorporate in animal welfare, like with a social services perspective, perhaps that, that cultural change needs to happen in the veterinary community. And I think you kind of spoke to that already. Yes. Thank you, Geraldine, for the question and the point that you're making. Many of the families enrolled in aligned care you just described, but it also makes the point why we need veterinary social work. As a veterinarian, I'm not equipped, trained to address mental emotional health issues. I respect that there are professionals who can. I'm not prepared to leave my clinic and go link that family with community resources so that they have a better existence. But there are professionals who do that kind of work every day. So what we're saying here is if one takes a one health approach and you are familiar with it, I've heard you speak about it. And for those to be reminded, one health is a paradigm, 21st century paradigm that says, in order to improve health outcomes, and for this audience, for pets, you have to factor in the humans and their ecosystem. The humans may not be dealing with only um, limited money, but limited capacity to, to understand what the veterinarian is asking them to do or explaining. And so this kind of goes back to Chris's uh, uh, question. Our industry is based on 15, 20 minute appointment windows. The people you just described don't, they can't fit into that paradigm. And so while veterinarians figure out a way to assist, I think we need to make sure that mental health professionals are those 
such as social workers, are in this mix because that's what they train to do. We just need to invite them in. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, Jen uh, Stonequist, would you like to unmute and raise your point? Sure. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so Hi, much for having this uh, space for all of us. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to just share about what's happening in Kitsap and what we found with working with local community clinics, because I think mm -hmm. that's a really good point that a lot of clinics have this um, idea that we're going to step in as animal welfare agencies and take clients and take work from them. And I think that um, for us, what really made a difference was involving clinics intentionally early on in the conversation, right? And inviting them to help step up and um, actually provide care alongside us for community members in need. And that um, really made a difference for us because we watched those same um, situations in other areas of the nation kind of crumble with this kind of us versus them mentality. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's been great so far. And I think like we've just started very small with clinics contacting us when they identify somebody who needs care. And we obviously don't have the ability to help everyone, but um, we're focusing on where we're needing where we're needed the most and mm -hmm. looking at ways to build up from there. So um, it's working here. And I'm just really interested in this conversation of how do we scale up and make things um, more sustainable in a larger picture manner. We're mm -hmm. planning to build a clinic and do a lot of great things. Um, and it's going to be an adventure, right? And a challenge. So I really yeah. appreciate this conversation. Well, well, congratulations on the successes that you guys are having. It really tells us, yes, <laughs> there can be a new reality in all of our communities. Um, and you're, you're living it. Uh, I will say to the animal welfare industry, uh, some of the adjustments that are needed, um, I can't name a lot of them, but couple that come to mind. Veterinarians cannot work for you for free. Okay. <laughs> and to expand on that, as small businesses, which most are by definition, there's limited capacity to give away the shop <laughs> uh, or give away things. You lose the shop in the, in, in the process. So starting with being sensitive to the fact that these individuals want to help, but they have some real practical barriers to being able to help. Um, that's why that pushback from a competitive standpoint happens because they, they have very little bandwidth. Uh, the other thing though is um, without a system, you take up a lot of time renegotiating fees. Every time there's another individual in now, I've got to renegotiate fees. So Align Care, being structured, has a predictable fee schedule. It's based on the veterinary clinic's fee that's been discounted. So they already know before you show up what they will get paid to take care of a certain problem. I think building in, uh, therefore, more structure and have a real system pop out We with the mindset that People can't give away their practices. Uh, I think we'll get to a better place. And one last thing, please don't, don't tell us we don't care about animal welfare. I've heard that way too many times. Uh, we're veterinarians. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> That's insane. We care about animal welfare. What we can't do is operate the way some may ask us to operate. We care about animal welfare. Thank you for, for all you guys are doing and pointing the way pointing the way. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Dr. B. Well, let's take one last question. Cindy uh, Quinneville, do you want to unmute? Thanks. Hello. So, um, you know, I've uh, been spent most of my correction, the human side of, of uh, services and social services and recently got into animal welfare. And one of the things that I have found most enlightening or frustrating, actually, is mm -hmm. as I try to work with the various government agencies and understand how funding that's pouring into our state to help the homeless and those being evicted isn't there to help to support the animals. And it's like I continually get told those dollars can't be used for that. So right. uh, to me, it's also it's it's like they're not seeing the whole family. They're seeing, you know, so so go ahead and surrender your animal. Um, and we'll let you go move into housing. So how do we, 
Yes. You know, <laughs> to me, that's so, a, it's, it's a big divide that we need to figure out how to fix. It is. And, and thank you for this, the question, Cindy. Now, what you're pointing to is the 20th century government back up. Those agencies don't make up the rules for their mission. They are given a mission through the legislative process and the dollars that they receive are earmarked for that mission. At the same time, under the United States laws, pets are still personal living property. Mm. The government doesn't go help you tend to your house and paint your house and, you know, so we have this fundamental misalignment. Why is it a misalignment? Because when those rules were written, when those agencies were formed, the focus was just on humans because it was social units made up of two or more humans that define families. Now up to about two thirds of our households have pets. Only 40% have children. So our society has shifted. And while the law may still say that dog is personal living property, our society doesn't operate that way anymore. So I, you, you're pointing to some structural misalignments that's work ahead of us. And understand these agencies can't just wake up one day and say, we're gonna have a new mission and we're gonna send the money over there to help, to help that organization. They don't have that latitude. It's the legislators that pass the laws defining those missions. And I'm optimistic about the millennials because they're the largest voting block, <laughs> as well as being the largest pet owning generation. So that gives me optimism that we can we can correct these misalignments going forward. Okay. Well, thank you. We don't let thank them off just... the hook, though. Right. No, I understand. Just, I, I, yeah. I, I'm I'm screaming to all that. Oh, listen. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Dr. B. So Sharon Harmon has very patiently had her hand up. Oh, what Sharon. a great use of technology, Sharon. So go ahead. We'll end Hi, with you. Sharon. Hey, Dr. B. Always a wonderful time to hear you speak. Well, thank, thank you. you I appreciate you hosting, hosting me out in your part of the world. Can't wait to have you back. Thank you. Hey, you know, the question of veterinary social work is really interesting. We just hired one of your graduates, Kelly Bremken, oh, to be our first veterinary sh social worker. Oh, I know she's wonderful, but we trained her first. She started with OHS. So, That's the best kind. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's really interesting is that once you add that suite of talent to your organization, all of a sudden there is a tremendous tenfold need that gets yeah. uncovered. Yeah. And I'm kind of struggling with where does it stop? How do you keep the focus on the clients? But in opening this new community teaching hospital, it's like we, we could hire honestly five and not have enough to do the work that is anticipated wow. to be needed. Wow. So how do you put boundaries on that? How do you keep the focus on the clients? Yeah. And Through careful definition of mission, policies and procedures. So we understand on day one, we can't do everything. We can't fix the whole problem, not in one step. So we ask ourselves, given the problem, its complexity, where is the most important place to start with the idea of building forward? Now, we, we need more veterinary social workers in this country. And of course, what we have now done is developed a certificate program for three different other types of people. These are non-social workers who get training we refer to them as human support coordinators or veterinary human support associates. I mean, there are terms that are being developed. Other universities are looking at starting veterinary social work programs. So hopefully we'll start to see more and more of them in our society. And we need them in our society because our families are bonded families. They're human and non-human. Social work is being redefined in, large, in a large extent. So I may not be answering your question directly, Sharon, except to say, yeah, you're putting your finger on some of the work ahead of us. And people like you, organizations like yours, are going to help point the way. You're going to help demonstrate the, the reason we need to continue on this path. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think for us, creating an intern program underneath that will yeah. also give more opportunities for real world experience. So yeah. look forward for that program to grow. I just got to figure out how to corral and protect the one person we have. The second uh, question you. I have was that how do you contain costs associated with 
chronic illnesses that have gone untreated for so long and are it's a long way, long climb out of that pit back to good health. And you're dealing with a client who can pay so little. How do you yes. find that balance point? So again, an excellent question. Let's understand that if we don't address the total cost of care, it's going to be a hard thing to ever get on top of. So under Align Care, our veterinarians are required to practice incremental veterinary care. That means this patient needs all of this to be done, but because of limited resources, I'm going to start here. This is the most pressing problem to address. And through time, we'll, we'll get, get into some of the others. So on one end, then we're controlling the overall cost. Put it, put it another way, if we don't address gold standard care that some people can afford, then it's going to make it that much more difficult. That's one thing we do, control the cost and then spreading those costs. Our families pay a copay. The veterinarian has discounted the fees by 20%. And then the fund pays a subsidy. So multiple parties are involved in assisting with that care. Um, incremental veterinary care, for those who don't understand that term, it's really saying that I can't do everything I want to do as a veterinarian, as a medical person, but there are things I can do. Quality medical care, um, it's just limited. And veterinarians have always had to do that. That's just an eight. We just didn't have a name for it. And our work gave it a name and, um, and broadly defined what that means we have a wonderful team of veterinarians that, that are working with us now to further refine what incremental veterinary care means. So Sharon, you, you're touching upon, um, you know, those core pieces of what it means to do better. Um, and we can fix those things, but we've got to intend to fix those things. At the end of the day, the families are not going to have enough money. So whatever the fix is, it involves subsidies. And if, if, we, if you want to think that we live in a, you know, someone may say, well, we don't live in a country where people are going to pay for someone, somebody else's pet. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. This nation built an animal sheltering industry that's robust because we live in a nation with a lot of people who are compassionate toward animals and toward people. So we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, Did I, I even know. answer your question, a point? Uh, we could talk for the next three days and we still have more <laughs> questions and answers. And, and I, you know, it's like the goal of the program is really to uh, address financial euthanasia as a diagnostic code, but I don't think we can ever eliminate. We just sometimes can slow it down and yeah. make animals comfortable, but uh, we, we have to like pull back from the gold standard that it's going to yeah. fix it all. It can. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you, Dr. B. Thank you. Thank you for being here today and all of you. We couldn't do this without all of you and we really appreciate it. I also want to tell you that Dr. Blackwell's presentation today was the last candid conversation we're doing in 2021, but we will be back again next year, 2022 with a whole new group of people doing candid conversations with you. So please, to get more of Dr. Blackwell, join him in the forum. And again, thank you all. Have a great evening. Appreciate you being here.